Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for loving us, calling us to be your children. And for this day, Father's Day, thank you for the fathers, for those that uh, shaped us, that helped to, helped to mold us and, and guide us. We trust that uh, you would be honored by all that they have done. For our study this morning, that as we look some more at you, look some more at, uh, at how we can understand you a little bit better so we can relate to you just a little bit better, that we would honor you and glorify you and we'd get it right from your word. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, who or what is God? We're in the second section, which is a general revelation. And we're in a, another section, the result of responding. Um, but I think I failed to... Yeah, here we go. We're, we're, in, a, we're in an area where we're talking about how people respond to general revelation. Take care, then, how you hear, for to one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. There's, as I looked at this, at this verse, I, I, I have to admit, the first time I looked at it, I didn't take it the way the author of this study is, is applying this verse. The author of the study is, is applying the verse that if we listen to the general revelation, not, we're, again, we're not talking about specific revelation, scripture and so forth, we're talking about general revelation. If we, if we accept that and we see from general revelation God, God is going to show us more. If we don't accept it, that God is going to show us less. That seems to be what, uh, what is being said here. He says the Bible teaches that if we respond to the revelation God gives, then he'll give us more. And if we don't respond, he'll take it away. Each one of us is always living under this principle. If we respond to revelation, whether that of nature or more specific in, of Scripture, then God will give us more revelation. So if we apply that principle, he's telling us that we will... It, revelation builds on previous revelation. Let's us see more because we've learned... Uh, it, is, it is like learning, your alpha, learning to read. How do you start to learn to read? You learn the alphabet. One letter at a time. That's exactly what my Greek professor told me. You're going to learn Greek one letter at a time, and then two letters at a time, and then three letters at a time, and then four letters, and then some of these long, great big words that have prefixes and suffixes and all that kind of stuff. Revelation of God to us is exactly the same. He's going to give us a little bit. That's basically what we see in general revelation. Kate, if, if you don't have any double A's, don't worry about it, or triple A's, don't worry about it. Okay, don't worry about it. I'll just use my phone. As God gives us revelation, when we understand that, then he moves us to, gives us to give us a little bit more. And then as we understand that, we get a little bit more. So now let's take that, move that into the, into the specific revelation of, of Scripture. I love the way... Our English texts are, are laid out because it begins at the beginning, which is probably a pretty good place to start, right? It, it starts with God creating. How does it end? We, you've got all of these, these years of, of development, but how does it end afterwards? It ends with God recreating the new heaven and the new earth. But in the process, he's, pro, he's given us progressive revelation that moves us along. 
what Adam and Eve knew after talking to God in the garden is not the same thing that, or is not as as much as John, um, the Apostle John, knew in the on the island of Patmos when he's writing the last book of the Bible. God revealed more and more and more and more. We call that progressive revelation. As we consider this, we should ask, how is this principle affecting our life? Am I receiving more because I've been faithful? Or am I losing what I already have because I've not been faithful? So that question would would force you to consider what does being faithful mean when you're talking about receiving God's revelation? I think it means a couple of things. One, it means fidelity to, the tr- to the, what Scripture says. It means fidelity to what God has revealed. If we're being faithful to that, and if we're being faithful to be in it. You know, we make a big deal around here about everyday reading, about being involved in the Scripture. Because, just imagine if you didn't talk to the person you were closest to. If you didn't allow them to talk to you and you didn't talk to them for periods of time. Let's say you only did it for an hour on Sunday morning. What would the relationship be like? It would be almost non-existent. Because you wouldn't hear from them and they wouldn't hear from you. You would have no ability. Well, reading God's Word is is receiving His communication to us. And so it's important. Take away revelation. Or taking away revelation. So how do we see this taking away happening throughout the world as people choose not to respond to general revelation, both around them and inside of them? How do you suppose God is taking away some of what he's revealed to us? Mm -hmm. Yep, taking the and uh, says, for example, the environmental movement, which is really a religious uh, movement. Um, they can argue all day long that it's not, but it really is. Um, the religion of, of man, it's really a form of humanism that uh, says that we're actually responsible and in charge and that we can actually change what's happening in the world. So it's, it's a religious movement, and it seeks to not see God. It seeks to see man as the supreme. Uh, as the alpha male. Scripture says, And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who, Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people. Um... Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make... Uh, the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and their and blind eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes the people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. In this uh, passage of Isaiah, the Lord's looking for a missionary to send. And so Isaiah responds, here am I, Lord, send me. However, God then calls him to go and make the hearts of of, of Israel callous, their ears deaf, their eyes blind, until God destroyed their cities. So God says, hey, I need a missionary. Isaiah says, okay, I'll go. And then God makes the people's, hardens the heart of the people. He closes their eyes. He stops up their ears. Is it? Nice. What what book are you working on? 
Oh, okay. That's a good read, by the way. As Isaiah preached, their hearts would continue to be hardened. You know, I, I've been impressed over the last couple of years as I was writing the stuff for Ezekiel, as I read through Jeremiah, and as I spend more time in Isaiah. And I look, and when, when I was writing material for the minor prophets, I'm, I was impressed by how God calls men to serve him and then he doesn't make it easy for them look at the prophets of israel god made it hard for them i mean here here's god calling isaiah saying hey i need a missionary to go out here i am send me god okay by the way i'm going to harden their hearts they're not going to be able to believe i'm going to close their eyes i'm going to close their ears they're not going to be able to see or hear you go out there and preach but they ain't going to listen God did that over and over and over again in the Old Testament. You look, almost all of the minor prophets had that frustration. I mean, some of them even had to marry, marry prostitutes. Some of them had to lay naked for a year on one side. And then turn over and lay naked for a year on the other side. God was just messing with them, wasn't he? But what was happening while he's doing that? He's removing some of the revelation that he's already given. We can go to, uh, to Romans chapter 1, where we see that happening in Paul's day, where people are just suppressing the truth. If we look at Israel today, the majority of the nation is either an atheist or agnostic. Romans chapter 11, verse 8. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, not of stupid, but of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. They're very closely related, yes. Stupor and stupid. Or Romans uh, 825. But if, if we're one, yes, 825. No, not the right one. It should be 1125. Hey, Kate, can you change that for me quick? Sure. He can. He says. Romans 11, 25, not 8, 25. Thank you. No, you haven't changed it yet. Never mind. There it is. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Thank you. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You know, we're talking about this in as we study Ezekiel. But God had a plan from the very beginning that included Israel not listening. And he hardened their hearts. And they rejected him. And he began the process in 722, and it continues on. And I believe the process will continue on until the end of the tribulation when the Battle of Armageddon happens and the, the Millennial Kingdom begins. That whole period from 722 B.C. until the end of the tribulation, I'm calling the period of the Gentiles, where God has hardened the heart of Israel, and they no longer even accept what he said. So if you go to Israel today, with the exception of the, of the real observant Jews, most of them are, I would say Israel is one of the most atheistic countries in the world. It's certainly one of the most progressive, and I don't mean that in a good way, um, countries. How um, Benjamin Netanyahu was prime minister for 12 years, I don't get because he's ultra-conservative, but the nation is not, because they're rejecting God. Jesus spoke more about this in Matthew chapter 13. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. What is that? That's God. 
not giving all of the revelation to them or not keeping it all available to them, blinding them to it. For to the one who has, more will be given in and he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, their case of prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For the people's heart was grown dull, with their with their eyes they can barely hear, and with their I'm sorry, with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have uh, closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you are are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So Jesus is telling his disciples, look. I've hardened the hearts of Israel because they don't need to hear. They're not worthy of hearing, but I've called you to hear. Your ears are open. Your eyes are open. The same holds true for us. We've been granted the ability to see and to hear. Some consider this a form of grace. Grace given to us to be able to hear from God, to understand God. A little bit. We'll never be able to understand God truly because He's He's transcendent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's sovereign. We're we're none of those things. We can't even understand those things. The person that tells me that they've got God figured out is the person that I believe doesn't know God. A God that you can figure out is not a God. It's an idol. And so to me, it's, it's comforting that I can't figure out God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Why did I put those verses back in? There it is. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness Suppress the truth. The natural inclination of, of unregenerate man is to suppress the truth of God. They don't want to know God. They don't want to know anything about God. They want to suppress the truth of God. Why? That's right. They, they don't want to have a, anybody with authority over them. Because if you recognize God as God, as sovereign, then He gets to make the rules. And if He gets to make the rules and you don't, you've got to be obedient to those rules, and those rules are not what you want. That's just the natural order of things for a sinful, fallen world. God's wrath is revealed against those who suppress the truth. Romans 1.22 says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, excuse me, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. The nations rejected the knowledge of God and began to worship the created thing. Paul then says that the denial of God led to God giving them over to their sexual immorality. It didn't take long in the, New, in the Old Testament for us to see how quickly man devolved into vile creatures. Just go to Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Abraham's uh, nephew Lot. Didn't take long. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped several or worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. Continuing on in that passage in Romans 
one twenty five. Because they exchanged the truth of, about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to the debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, and malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of the evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. As a judgment for not responding to God's revelation, the pagan world was given a reprobate mind, given a mind that is just absolutely not desirous of following God. And that reprobate mind led them into all sorts of ungodliness and immorality. They refused the revelation of God, and their minds were given over to all kinds of sin. As a judgment by God, the unbelieving world could not even distinguish between right and wrong. Isn't that the world we live in today? Where wrong is called right and right is called wrong? Where everything that we think we know about what's true, the world says is wrong? Because the Gentiles rejected God's natural revelation, God took away the natural revelation in their conscience. The natural law in man became skewed and they approved of the very things that they once thought were wrong. Promoted sexuality, homosexuality, murder, and all kinds of evil. And it became acceptable in society. There was a taking away because they rejected God's revelation. When we don't respond, God takes it away. Many times we think of God's wrath like a spanking. He judges with a flood. He destroys by angels as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. He brings poverty and war as with Israel, but sometimes his wrath comes by saying, okay, do what you want. It's kind of a self-correcting problem, right? Go ahead and do what you want. Because what's the end result of sinfulness? Death. God takes away his revelation. He says, okay, do whatever you want. The author of this uh, study puts in a personal note here. He said, I was an assistant coach for a college basketball team in Chicago for five years. I coached two years with guys and three years with girls. I remember coaching with uh, the guys, and sometimes certain players felt like the coach had it out for them. It seemed from their perspective that he was harder on them in practice than on the other players. And I'd often tell them, when a coach stops talking to you, then you have a problem. That means you won't be playing and he's given up on you. So when God stops trying to influence us, then we've got a problem is what he's saying. In some ways, that's similar to Revelation. God speaks to us because he wants us to know him. But if we choose to suppress his revelation through sin, he says, okay, do what you want. Have your own way. I'm going to stop speaking. And I'm going to withdraw the protection that I've given. And he allows us to reap the consequences of sin. I believe that many of the tragedies we have experienced, both individually and corporately, come from the consequences of this principle. A taking away of revelation. A hardening of of the conscience. I think our world is living that out today on full display in the headlines every day. So we move on to another section then, the giving of more revelation. What if a person does heed the call 
of general revelation. Scripture indicates that God would give them more revelation and potentially even knowledge leading to salvation. Remember, general revelation in itself does not lead to salvation. It needs more. You need more. We see people in Scripture who God miraculously saves though they had a limited revelation. They'd been faithful in a little, and God gave them more. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Now, I'm going to be preaching on that this morning, so pay attention. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continuously to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. I'm going to talk about this more in the, in the worship hour, but Cornelius is a Roman centurion of a very special elite special forces group. He was a follower of God in as much as he knew. And what he knew was the, the God Jehovah, and he knew about, be, about being good, and he knew about giving, but he didn't know a whole lot. So God then made it possible through Peter to know more, and he and his household could be saved. God responded to his worship of God in its limited capacity that it was and provided someone to lead him to Christ. People often criticize the church when we make the argument that, that salvation is very, very specific and it is very, very selective. Only those that God called, only those that, that, that are following Jesus get to go to heaven. Nobody else. So the, we get criticized then, well, what about the people in deepest, darkest Africa that have never seen a white guy? Do you think that the, God, the sovereign God of the universe has the ability to organize it so that somebody can bring the gospel to them? Absolutely. Absolutely. You think it's also possible that God didn't choose them? Yeah, that's possible too. See, he's, he's the creator, sustainer of the universe. That he, he's, he's sovereign over every tiny littlest thing. So he has the ability to orchestrate bringing somebody to them. Whether it's in the Amazonian jungle, or it is in deepest, darkest Africa, or in the aborigines of Australia, or the... Uh, the people in, in parts of China that have never seen anybody but a Chinese person, that have no idea who Jesus is, have no idea who Jehovah God is, it's entirely possible that at the right time, at the right place, God brings somebody. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch sitting on the side of the road. He, he understood who God was. He wanted to be a follower of Jehovah God. And Philip is brought to bring him the message and teach him who that is. As we respond to general revelation, God will provide us more revelation. You see an example of Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. In chapter 8, verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the, the south, toward the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So God superintends here. He intervenes and knocks on Philip's head and goes, hey, Philip, go here. Do this. I have a mission for you. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seating in the, a city, seated in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. 
Go over and talk to him. He's, he's getting primed. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I understand unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So we, it wasn't too long ago that we went worked through that. God superintended. God brought the right person at the right time. Sometimes that might be you. Talk about that more in the message this morning. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Listen to what God has to say. Take care of how you hear. For the one who has, more will be given. And for the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. If we reject God's revelation, he's going to take more of what we have away from us. No one can accuse God of injustice, for it's by his mercy that anybody is saved. We do not deserve eternal life. No one does. Not even the guy living in the deepest, darkest jungles of, of the Amazon or of Africa. They don't deserve to live. Because they too are sinners. It was fortified because of man's sin, our, our need for death, the requirement of death. Therefore, God is merciful in choosing to reveal Himself to us and to choose some of us to be saved. Some people may say that that's not fair. How can, the God, how can God give the gospel to some and not to others if it's only the gospel that can save? God is just because he gives us witness. And if we respond, he'll give us more. So let's, let's apply that to the guy in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa that have never seen a white guy. They have the same general revelation. Creation, sky, life, conscience. They have the same revelation. But if they reject, what does God do? Takes away. If, they, if they're looking, they're saying, there's got to be something, what does God do? He sends a Dr. Livingston. Or he sends a streetcar conductor from Philadelphia to plant the first Grace Brethren Church in Africa. What does God do? God sends them a messenger. Just like Peter went to Cornelius and Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch. We must understand the general revelation given is given in order to lead man to seek more of God. Acts chapter 17, verse 27. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, yet He is actually not far from each one of us. Now, Paul will later write that no one seeks after God. That's true. But that's not in conflict with what he says here. Because how do we seek after God? Exactly. So you're in deepest, darkest Africa, and you see general revelation, and you begin to wonder, how does that work? Because the Holy Spirit begins to prompt you. I was reading this past week a theological journal article about whether or not the Holy Spirit can influence a non-redeemed person. And I thought the premise of the article was completely wrong because you will never be a redeemed person if the Holy Spirit can't prompt an unredeemed person. Because salvation only comes at the behest of God. Because we can't seek after God. We only seek God because God gives us the direction to seek God. He reveals himself to us and we begin to follow because the Holy Spirit draws us. Now, 
What does that reveal to you about salvation? That's right. The only thing we contribute to salvation is our broken dead self. I know I've used the illustration before, but it's a cool one, so I'll use it again. The guy that's dead on the floor, who has no heartbeat, can't call for the paddles and go clear. It doesn't work. Somebody has to do it. And what is your position before God when you're not redeemed? Dead. It requires somebody to do it. God acts on you. General revelation places the burden on Christians to share the gospel. As I said earlier, general revelation doesn't save anybody. It can draw people. It can be part of what the Holy Spirit uses to draw us to God. But in itself, it doesn't save anyone. Scripture says those that see general revelation and want more will get more. But it should be noted that because general revelation does not save, it puts a burden on those that God uses to reveal more to people. The gospel of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins is part of specific revelation, which is what we're going to study next. Christ himself has given each Christian a call to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Therefore, go and make disciples. How do you make disciples? You teach them to observe all that God has commanded. After you baptize them. So making disciples is a process of, of teaching people that have desired to become followers of Jesus. And people are, have a desire to follow Jesus because they've seen in general revelations or in general terms that there is a God, and the Holy Spirit has drawn them to see and recognize who God is. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seeds, fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, and they did not have much soil. And they immediately sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some, 30, some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Creation does its part. And then we have to do our part. We have to be the guys out there sowing the seed. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. Maybe. I'll get to it. There it is. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Apostle Paul tells the Romans, listen, God sent you a missionary to give you the word of God. To tell you what you were seeking. Oh, by the way, you were seeking it because God told you to seek it. God revealed it to you. God has sent each one of us to preach the good news so that all will hear the gospel of Jesus. 
we were all saved through the work of someone around us. And then we have to turn around and do it for others. Here's the conclusion of this section. It would be perfect timing to conclude, too. How do we know there is a God? The Bible never argues for the existence of God. The Bible assumes the existence of God. So how do we know there is a God? Because God revealed himself. God revealed himself in, in just simply in nature. You can't look at nature and believe it's by accident. I know that's what the world wants to do. But that's because they're suppressing the truth, as Paul says in Romans 1.18. He reveals to us that he's there through the fact that we're here. You know, revelation or evolution has never been proven. Even though it's taught as a science, it is still a theory. A theory that is constantly being adapted. <laughs> that makes sense for evolution. It is a theory that has yet to be proven. So when you reflect on nature, what's the natural conclusion you get from nature? There has to be something, some intelligent designer that designed what we have. That's why I like some of the arguments that intelligent design has, such as the amount of oxygen in the air. Things would be dramatically different if the oxygen was just a little bit heavier or a little bit less. Go to the top of Trail Ridge Road in, uh, in Colorado and just try to walk across the parking lot. It's really hard to do. Because at 18,000 feet, there's not a lot of oxygen. And we don't fare well. Just go under the water and try to breathe. No, don't do that. It'll, it'll hurt. If you don't have scuba tanks on, it's going to hurt. Why? God designed us for a specific place. The earth is situated on an axis so that we have seasons. And we're just the right distance away from, from the sun so that we have the right temperatures. You know, a mile either direction, would we'd be all dead a long time ago. That's pretty incredible. How does that happen by accident? It doesn't. The mind doesn't let you believe that unless you absolutely have to say, God, it does not exist. He re reveals, God reveals himself through our conscience as well. Look at Romans 2.15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse them, or even excuse them. God wrote on our hearts when he created us a conscience, a morality. In studying sociology, I find it fascinating that every society in history has had a set of mores that sort of resemble what God said. Why? Why would the people in deepest, darkest Africa that have never seen a white guy don't know who God is, why would they have rules that are very similar to the same rules we have? Why? Because God wrote them on their heart. Because we have a conscience. Now, it's true, you can sear your conscience. You can suppress your conscience. We call that sociopath or psychopath. Doesn't mean you don't have a conscience, just means you suppress it. So God has written on the hearts and revealed to us, but men want to not listen to God. But if men does if men do listen to God, God will reveal more to them. If men in the deepest, darkest Africa or the Amazonian jungle desire to know God because God gave them that desire, then God will reveal it to them. He'll send a missionary. 
I was reading the other day of a of a group in in northern Siberia, north eastern Siberia. Not really related to anybody, just hunkered down there in the cold where it's like, you know, below, below zero like nine months of the year. <sighs> and there was a, a group of, of people within this group that that they they didn't travel anywhere. They couldn't go anywhere. They were landlocked. They couldn't sail or anything like that. And they didn't really know of the rest of the world. And what did God do to uh, to send the gospel? He crashed a plane. And in that plane were some missionaries that led this this village to Christ. Don't tell me God can't do it. But God can do anything He wants to do within His character. We'll look at other ways that God reveals Himself, which we'll call special revelation. It's special because it's been given to specific people. But here are some review questions for us. What is general revelation and what are the primary ways God reveals Himself? Creation, morality, that's all general revelation. What happens when people respond to general revelation? What happens when people reject it? When people respond, God gives them more. When people reject, God takes even more from them. How would you respond to a person that questions God's justice because of people who have never heard of the gospel? Can God still be just if every person does not get the opportunity to hear the gospel? Yes, because every person has sinned. Explain the concept of natural law. What evidences are there of this concept, specifically when considering it teaches that everybody has an innate knowledge of God? Natural law is your morality, is what is just naturally in your brain, in your conscience. Any questions, comments? Next week, Lord willing, we'll begin with uh, the giving of more revelation. As we begin to look at special revelation. Father, thank you for allowing us to spend some time in your word. Thank you for, for the, the revelation that you've given us. Thank you that you called us to be your children and that you made it possible for us to hear the gospel and respond. We love you and we want to serve you. We, we look to worship you in the service to follow through our, through our fellowship and through our music and through our continued study. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.